My scripture for this morning's sermon is taken from Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and Jonah became angry. Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than for me to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. Then God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over Jonah's head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of God for the people of God. It is very good to be here with you all this morning. My name is Jermaine Ross Alam, and I serve as the director of the Center for the Repair of Historic Harms at the Presbyterian, Presbyterian Mission Agency. And I send greetings from our agency and especially from our executive director and president, Diane Moffitt. And I thank you so much for introducing me, Reverend Patrice. And as Reverend Patrice already let you know, I began my ordained ministry about 10 years ago, and that was in the city of Minneapolis. And during the time that I lived in the city of Minneapolis, I served proudly, as you already heard, as the first executive director of 21st Century Academy and as an associate pastor at Kwanzaa, now Liberty Community Church, PCUSA. And I was also an associate minister at Oak Grove Presbyterian Church in nearby Bloomington, also known as the home of the Mall of America. <laughs> and it was at that time that the Twin Cities were becoming a cauldron simmering with a rage that was threatening to boil over until eventually it did explode. I completed seminary in the Twin Cities and I began my career in ordained ministry with the PCUSA in the days when the world watched our nation's legal system vindicate and liberate the neighborhood watchmen who shot Trayvon Martin to death after police officers told him over the phone that they did not need him to follow Trayvon. Those were years when everyday conversation seemed to me to be inspired by a controlled climate of media outrage, selective forensic debates, and unbelievably stubborn denial. And it was as if limitless outrage and diabolical denial had simply become the weather. In that climate, while I was visiting sick people, 
calling students' parents on the phone, preaching and teaching, especially about justice and racial violence. It was in that climate that I felt pressure building up all around me while the churning rhythms of debate, outrage, and denial culminated in a climate seething with blinding pessimism, fatigue, and fury. In that social and emotional cauldron, nearly everyone seemed to be stewing in their own juice of vehemence and rage. Even as I was trying to keep my own emotions within a manageable, professional range, I soon discovered that unabated range was also churning, almost involuntarily, inside of me, especially when what I really needed to do was just simply sit down and be still and imagine a path that might lead to a future much better than anything I had ever allowed myself to imagine before. And then finally, a time came after a whole lot of prayer and even more meditation. And a time came when I learned how to laugh with God at the prophet Jonah inside myself. And it was only then when I finally understood that while righteous anger could wake me up, that same anger was powerless to answer the question, what must happen next? Through prayer, and plenty of blessed silence. The Holy Spirit showed me that I thought I was angrier than God over the state of God's own people. In prayer and in meditation and while working with our people, I learned that God had the right to be angry with me instead if I fell so in love with my own righteous anger that I neglected to move from seeking vindication to faithful innovation. And I remembered that God loves God's world more than any of us hate our own oppression. I asked myself a deadly serious question during that time. I asked, is it possible anymore for me to preach and teach the gospel in this anti-democratic settler colony? I had to ask myself even this morning, if it is possible for me to preach the gospel that entered into this world through the work of a Palestinian mother's child, can I preach his gospel in this nation in which apparently very fine people on both sides refuse to imagine counting past the number two when it comes to creating new options to replace our death-dealing political party loyalties? I have to ask the question often, Is it still possible for me to preach the good news that the whole reality of God is a real possibility in this world? And if so, is it possible to compose sermons about love, grace, and justice if I don't preach in 2023 that God is powerful enough and faithful enough to inspire God's own image to live according to the truth that racist, colonial, and apartheid relationships between human beings have no right to exist. Can I preach if I don't say that? I don't know about you, but the Spirit of God in me also inspires me to ask, does not my faith include fidelity to a process of working with God and not working against God to solve historical problems that we human beings have created and thoroughly enjoy in historical time? These are the questions God throws in my face every time that I am tempted to stew longer than common sense requires in the boiling water of my own righteous anger. And it was only when I complained to God and finally heard what I sounded like to God. Only then was I able to learn what it was that Jonah had to learn. But what was it again that the prophet Jonah needed to learn? I'm glad you asked. Of all of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, Jonah resonates the most in me. This is not because of the prophet's bold denunciation of oppression and evil. Social justice rants aren't technically older than sin, but I think you get the point. Instead, Jonah's significance 
lies not in the social justice sermon that God gave Jonah to preach against the people of Nineveh. Jonah's significance instead lies in what God teaches Jonah when Jonah's sermon ends up working. Jonah finally obeys God, obeys God's call to preach against the city of Nineveh and to speak out against their wicked and infamous oppression of their neighbors. And then Jonah climbs up to the top of a hill to just lay back and observe how it's going to look when God destroys the wicked city. Yet, when God's word, straight from Jonah's mouth, mind you, actually transforms the hearts of the people, Jonah gets angry enough to die, as if Jonah's real investment was in stoking the fire of his own prophetic anger, when instead, Jonah could have easily slipped into another world of divine possibility and divine action based on Jonah trusting God's power to transform oppressors into comrades. Yes, Jonah did what God asked Jonah to do, and apparently Jonah did it quite well. But then, oddly, Jonah waited to behold his oppressor's demise when instead Jonah could have started by noticing that the people were already in sackcloth and ashes. And yes, sackcloth and ashes, that is the traditional public performance of piety and repentance. And we do get sick of that from time to time, do we not? But nevertheless, whether Jonah believed his eyes or not, Jonah could have believed in God's power to transform at least a few Ninevites' hearts. Is that not correct? Jonah could have assumed in faith that God was transforming enough of them to justify Jonah using his own imagination to seize the moment and burst into action and start negotiating, perhaps, or even organizing the social justice changes and repairs that oppressed people in his time had been calling for for decades. Jonah could have done that. Jonah could have gotten a head start on some truly transformative work based solely on the fact that God was making a way out of no way. After all, if God failed to change the hearts of the beings entrusted with God's own image, is that any of Jonah's business? If God fails to transform the hearts of those who oppress us and the ones that we love, is that failure on God's part any of our business? Is Jonah, or are we, supposed to preach messages of transformation only to behave in public as if Creator God is a failed creator who cannot inspire God's own image to act humanly in God's world? I don't know about you, but that kind of failure does not sound anything like the God we claim to know in the person of Jesus Christ. In our sanctified imaginations this morning, let us consider that Jonah could have noticed a flurry of social justice programming in Nineveh, perhaps. Some of it useful, yes. Some of it, undoubtedly, a little suspect. Jonah could have presumed the sincerity of at least some of the people. Jonah could have touched base with at least some of those people in order to activate plans to institute, I don't know, something like true and lasting democracy in our workplaces? Maybe demilitarization processes? How about even an institute for the study of universal housing? Or even something as wild and audacious as a Presbyterian Center for the Repair of Historic Harms? The sky is the limit. Jonah had many options to choose from rather than preaching repentance and simply waiting for God to vindicate the preacher. We don't really know for sure, of course, what Jonah could have done. Why don't we know? Because Jonah believed his own social justice, hellfire and brimstone routine more than he believed in the power of God and apparently more than he was willing to invest his own moral imagination in building the future that true faith makes possible. So what new reality might we step into from right here where we stand today? What will we do now if we believe that God is able to transform the very people 
that God created to be capable of responding to God's voice? Could our denomination as a whole, could our other fellow Protestant churches in the United States as a whole, could any of us at the very least heed the call to our, from our fellow Christians for a ceasefire in Gaza? Or has the sound and fury of the apartheid propaganda machine successfully wilted our moral fiber? Could we at the very least try? Could we at least call for a ceasefire when we remember that it is not a coincidence that our Savior served bravely and was killed in the line of heavenly duty on earth in Palestine? Might we at the very least at least help, try, Shouldn't we at least urge our leaders, the people whose job it is to carry our will to high places, could we not help them be inspired to call for a ceasefire? Since the cross of Jesus, after all, reveals the evil habit that we have of making the innocent into surrogates who bear the brunt of other people's sins. Could justice-loving, blue, no matter who Christians learn to count past the number two and thereby help free this planet from our voluntary servitude to our apartheid-supporting nuclear state? Instead of just being angry and burying ourselves deeper and deeper into the toxic and into the impotent worlds of keyboard warriors and social media snipers, let us show some gratitude to God for Christ's sake. Let us show our gratitude for our God-given capacity for righteous anger, and then after we have shown our God-given capacity for righteous anger, let us keep it moving toward righteous innovation, away from anger beyond its proper function, away from distorting our personalities by nursing fantasies of vindication. Just let God make us into what God made us to be faithful, justice-loving, innovators, always working and always praying to be the human beings our Creator is shaping us to be. Shouldn't an omnipotent triune God, after all, be capable of inspiring, completing, and sustaining their own image in their own creation according to their likeness? Shouldn't we just presume that and do what we are supposed to do according to the reality of God's own faithfulness. I believe so. In fact, I know so. So let us listen for what God is telling us about ourselves through the lesson that Jonah had to learn. Let us not fail to imagine that God must be angry listening to us sound like Jonah's in the 21st century as if we are angrier than God about the death of God's children, our siblings. Is it right for you to be angry? God asks Jonah as Jonah cries over the wet blanket of divine grace, quenching Jonah's prophetic fire. Is it right for you to be angry? God is asking us when we are the ones selling short God's image in us, basting in our own anger while refusing to take the faithful step that trades in dreams of vindication for faithful innovation and transformative repair? Anger is that smoke, and anger is that fire that awakens us and lets us know that something requires our immediate attention. But anger itself does not clarify what must and what can be done. Anger out of its lane could be the reason why it always seems to go that we wouldn't know what to do even if God suddenly turned all the red states blue or whatever color of globalized injustice has managed to capture our loyalties this morning. Our job is to believe on this Reformation Sunday that God bends human desires not only toward dreaming freedom dreams, that is only the beginning. Our job is to respond in faith to the reality that God's Holy Spirit persuades us to believe that God bends human hearts toward the administration of justice and the administration 
of peace. It is our job to respond in faith so that we might exercise our freedom and so that we might perform our duty to choose by persisting in the work that faith compels us to complete. We do not love God's world more than God does. We are not angrier than God over the death of God's children who are caught up in the savage meat grinder we choose to make out of God's creation. And I pray we never make righteous anger an excuse to forget that God changes hearts simply because it is in God's nature to bring to completion faithful responses to God's transformative grace. Jonah helps us remember that God is invested in life and not death. God is invested in a new creation far more than anyone's vindication, including God's. Jonah helps us learn that especially when hard truths have to be shouted at the top of our lungs, we must never lust after the heat of our own prophetic fire. And certainly, we must never love our hatred of our own oppression more than we love to be at good work in good faith, repairing what has been broken, engineering a better future, and investing in God's work being done on earth according to how it is in heaven. But like Jonah, a prophet creative enough to believe that he could hide from his own creator in his creator's own world, we are called to be creative. We are called to be faithful, and we are called to be productive. So let us create. Let us be creative enough to work with God to actually build a new beginning that is truly worth all of the grinding effort it takes to live well together, especially in these infuriating times. If it is the will of God, may it be so. Amen.